Keating versus Howard. Good evening, I'm Jeff McMullen. Well, finally, after much debate, the great debate. For Paul Keating, behind in the polls, it's a chance to regain lost ground. For John Howard, an opportunity to consolidate. For all of us, a time to decide. In a moment, we'll be crossing live and without commercials for the next hour to Ray Martin. Here in this studio, we'll be scoring the leaders and later bringing you the verdict. In our audience tonight, uncommitted voters, selected by Roy Morgan Research. They're ordinary Australians, chosen precisely because they haven't yet made up their minds. Each has one of these electronic monitors. Turn this way indicates they like what's being said. This way, they don't. Each of the monitors is hooked up to a central computer which averages the reaction of the entire audience and which appears on a screen like this. High when the audience is in favour, low when it's not. Because this broadcast is being fed to other stations, the worm won't be seen during the actual debate. Our audience and the worm will come into play afterwards when I return with political correspondent Paul Lynham to analyse the debate. But right now we're ready to cross to Ray Martin, moderator of tonight's proceedings. Welcome and thank you for joining us in the Channel Line studios tonight, live for what we hope will be a lively, great debate. Gentlemen, thank you both for uh, being with us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Paul Keating and John Howard have agreed to the ground rules tonight, yes. equal time and a fair go, of course. And they ask for this to be a freewheeling debate, ranging from a host of topics that both interest and trouble you voters as you try to make, make up your minds <coughs> this election year. They've both agreed to keep their answers as brief as possible. Good luck on that one when we come down to it. John Howard has won the, the toss to keep that cricket in analogy going, and Paul Keating has been sent to bat. So the first ball to you, Paul. As the Prime Minister, are you the servant of the people or the boss? Oh, absolutely the servant. I've always taken the view that, that one thing about the, the Australian three-year parliamentary term is that every three years you've got to come back and explain, explain yourself, explain what you've done, and seek a fresh mandate because this is the one time the one time in the parliamentary cycle where the men and women of Australia can find out what the party leaders think where our policies are going to enfranchise them to sign the party leaders up now I've always been a very willing participant in that process I think I've done more press conferences than anyone in Australian federal history over the years uh, I'm happy to debate anywhere anytime I handle all the doorstops that anyone asks well, me. Well, you sure about that over the last two weeks. No, no, well, I, uh, it was sure for me. But let me just say this. I believe in accountability, that all power flows from the people, as it must, and that real power can only come if a government has the support of the people. So I regard this as a very legitimate part of the process of going back, saying what I believe, what the government wants to do, uh, seeking their support, and in getting it, having them sign the government up for three more years. And then we do it all over again the next time. Well, John Howard, it seems that the street vibe is that you haven't served, neither of you have served the people very well. In fact, there's a distinct message that they don't like Paul Keating, and they regard you as they're fed up with him, and they regard you as someone who's been recycled three times. How do you get over that cynicism? Well, I think we'll know about that on the 2nd of March, but um, I get over that if it exists by putting a very simple proposition that when you've had a government that's been in power for 13 years and it's showing all the signs that this government is of being out of touch, of being arrogant, of taking people for granted. Uh, the, the treaty with Indonesia, a classic case, what the Prime Minister said when he was asked why didn't you take the people into your confidence, he said well if I'd have told them they mightn't have liked it. I mean what, what, a, what a mark of arrogance, in other words these high and mighty things are too important for we the leaders, we the governors of Australia to let the people in about them. I mean, a moment ago he said he was the servant of the people. He wasn't the servant of the people when it came to the signing of that treaty, which conceptually I agreed with, but the process was all wrong. So you have this mark of arrogance. I mean, 13 years is a long time and all the signs of arrogance are there, all the signs of remoteness, all the signs of being out of touch. And when you look at the record, you have to acknowledge that there are fundamental weaknesses in Australia at the present time. We have a foreign debt which is now over $180,000 million. We have a scandalous level of youth unemployment. 
we have this arrogant view in relation to small business from the Prime Minister that this is as good as it gets. I mean, what an insult to the small business men and women of Australia for this man to say that this is as good as it ever gets when we've got some of the highest real interest rates in the world, when we've got an enormous amount of red tape, when we've got unfair dismissal laws that are actually discouraging small business from taking on more staff. So, so you've really, I mean, I get over any cynicism by saying that after 13 years, the arrogance, the taking for granted attitude is there and the failed record is there. And of course, on top of that, ringing in everybody's ears in this election campaign is a word called LAW law, well, well, which is well, a symbol of this government's we'll deceit of yeah. the Australian people. Well, Ray, do you want me to cover the waterfront there? So okay. I think we'll come well, back to a lot me, of those. Let me take some of those things. Up. No, no, hey, we'll come back to some of those. But I think, obviously, I really just wanted to open statement. But, but similarly, it, it's obviously about perceptions, irrespective of what you say, or what Paul Keating says. It's what the public think. A woman on Talkback Radio just last week I heard say that I agree that it's time for a change. She said, but John Howard has got to offer something more exciting than a half-dead version of the past. That's a perception, John. Well, that's, that may be the perception of some, but the perception of others is that uh, I offer people uh, a sense of optimism and a sense of change, that I am addressing the problem of youth unemployment. People are responding to the fact that I have a practical vision to reduce unemployment by getting small business to go again. You get a mixture of views on talkback radio. I've heard just as many people saying, I admire the fact, John, that despite some of the adversity that you've been through, you've stuck there, you've survived. It shows that you've got a commitment to Australia's future. It shows that you've hung in over the long haul uh, to implement the values and principles for, for which you've always stood. All right, on perceptions, Paul, the other perception, of course, Sir Wayne Goss has said, your mate in Queensland has said that, in fact, Queenslanders are waiting on the front porch with a baseball bat, ready to clobber you when you get up there. Oh, well, they said that was all that, all that sort of, Ray, all that sort of stuff was around three years ago. And all this stuff that John goes on about, about arrogance, honesty and credibility in public life starts with policies. The most arrogant thing you can do to the Australian community is not show them your policies. John has been elected now leader of the Liberal Party for 13 months. We're now 20 days away from the election. He has no policy on health out there. I'm the only party leader going to an election with funded policies. He has no funding his policies and he's not been prepared today to say they're there. Well, look, can I just, can just, can just say, and so, so when one talks about arrogance, I think arrogance is saying to the public, because when Mr Howard says, when John says to me, I won't show you my policies, he's really saying, I won't show the Australian people my policies. So to be 20 days away from election, that I think is high arrogance. Can I also say, just correct a couple of things. With Indonesia, I never ever said the Australian community wouldn't like it. I was very proud of that work. But you'd have, to, you'd, ha you'd have to be unreal to think that a country which has been largely governed by a government which has very strong links to a very large army, which was part of the whole independence movement of the country, if anyone thinks that you can, you can secure a treaty of substance with a public discussion before those people do not think about it or come to judgments about it, I mean, it would have been impossible for me to negotiate that without first developing that through the Indonesian Armed Forces, the Indonesian Government, and then saying immediately to the Australian people, upon it being agreed, here it is. Can I just take up another point? John said now for a year about the LA law tax cuts. This is one of the great mistruths of Australian politics. The first round was paid in full on the 1st of November 1993, in full. Brought forward a year early and paid in full. The second round was put back by 12 months to 1997 and in John's own policy document he says we'll be paying the earmarked, get the word, the earmarked tax cuts into superannuation accounts. Well if he's paying the tax cuts into superannuation accounts that we promised, how come he can say we, we broke our promise? If he's actually portending these documents, he's going to pay them, how can, well, how can he say that they've not been paid? when the first round had been paid in full and he intends to pay the second. Well, let's go to specifics I mean, then. Let's go to specifics, John. I mean, today the, uh, the Prime can, Minister John. pulled, Mr Kenny pulled a rabbit out of his hat by uh, saying the, the government, his government, if he gets re-elected, uh, will pay for its election promises by collecting $800 million from Australia's richest people who've been avoiding tax. Was this the killer punch that you uh, feared? Really? I mean, 13 years. Isn't it convenient? It only turns up on the doorstep three weeks out from the election. Last December. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Last so, December. yeah, you've had 13 years and isn't it convenient 
that it lands on the doorstep. But look, I'll have, I'll have a look at that. If, if, if there are any measures that are needed to stamp out rampant tax avoidance, they will have our support. But the real issue about costings, Ray, is why won't Paul allow the head of the Treasury to brief me and therefore the Australian public on the state of the budget outlook for next year. That's the killer. That's the key issue about costing. I mean, it's good enough to send the Commissioner of Taxation down to Melbourne to brief Peter Costello about tax avoidance, but it's not good enough to send the head of the Treasury. Day. Yes, it happened this afternoon. Right he saw him at six o'clock. So you can put Carmody on the plane down to Melbourne to brief Costello about tax, but you won't tell us, Paul, whether the estimate of forward estimates of the budget of last May, you won't tell us. You won't let the head of the Treasury tell, tell us whether there's tell been you all any I change. Can, John. Hmm? I'll tell you all I can. No, no, what about letting the head of the Treasury tell us? Because Look, he's, just, the, he's the umpire. Okay, right, we I'll all believe him. Point over a lot of Australians don't believe you, and they, some Australians may not believe me, but they all believe the independent umpire. Why won't you let Ted Evans tell us whether there's been any change in the forecast on the budget? The big issue in this election, Ray, with spending, is whether the spending adds to the budget task, is neutral to the budget task, or actually relieves the budget task. Today, when I stood up and announced that funding, our, our, our commitments amount to three and a half billion over four years, and the measures I announced today will raise seven billion over four years, twice as much. We would be, I think, the only government in federal history that ever went to an election campaign and actually improved the budget in the course of the election. Well, what about Act the question, no, though? Well, hang on. How about hang that on question? Act actually improved the budget in the course of the election. So what we're doing, not only are our commitments, that is, the, the big extension of Medicare into dentistry and ophthalmology and physiotherapy, announced will be delivered and are now paid for, like the Pacific Highway is announced by us and paid for, like the ferries in Tasmania, paid for, like the busway in Brisbane, Paid for, but why isn't, it possible paid for, why isn't it possible for you, as Mr Howard just said, to simply, as the Prime Minister, say to the Head of Treasury, get your computers out, tell us what yeah, the situation but, is right but, now? But, just understand this point. That is, the debate arose about the parties not showing where the money's coming from. I'm the only person in this election, I'm the only one in this room, who's actually said where the money's coming from. And I put it all out there today, and I'd be very pleased to know whether John... Howard is going to have, would he as a government, actually support the tax commissioner to follow down those people, 100 individuals, but Paul, you, you avoiding keep, 800 million You keep avoiding the tax. question oh, no, that journalists have asked with last well, week. I mean, right, right. Is there a deficit? What's the latest? Why can't you give Australian well, people, not John Howard, yeah. the Australian people the latest right. figure? What, we, what we've given is that what John Howard never gave in office, and that is the three out years of the budget balance, the three out years of the surplus. John Howe's telling us we have to look at the books. You know what the, the, the forecast surplus for, for the coming year was? 3.4 billion. What did he do with it? He cut 2.5 billion out of it in the Senate by knocking over the airport privatisations. In other words, he's so concerned about the budget surplus, he actually put a $2.5 billion hole, and what for? To save his own seat of Benelong. Now, I've told people, and I'll tell you, Ray, what we n need to get the number for the budget surplus for the coming year is the December quarter national accounts, the March quarter, the June quarter, the full tax year's base, and when we get those things, we'll get a number. We'll get that in the first week of August. The budget is not till August. And to be going around making this point now, and let me just say, in 1983, when I was sworn as treasurer after John Howard, I'm sure all Australia knows that he carried in his head that $9.6 billion number, which he kept secret all the way through the election campaign, 4.5% of GDP, you know what that is in today's dollars, Ray? A $22 billion budget deficit in today's dollars. So because he did it, it's no, okay. No, no, no. Well, he, 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 kept, he, he kept that a secret from, from the public, and it was announced to me by the Secretary of the Treasury in the closed bar of the Lakeside Hotel with his colleagues saying, here's the bad news. Ray, so you won't show him the latest No, I'm just telling him. The latest, we've got a mid-year review. We've just published a mid-year review of the budget, just, uh, just a, a few weeks ago. In other words, we publish three forward years of outlays, right. three forward years of receipts, and three forward years okay. of the budget balance, plus a half-year review. Well, you just said that you've been treasurer. Is that the no, latest? No, but just let it be understood what the Prime Minister has just said 
is that he so holds the Australian people in contempt that he won't tell the 18 million shareholders of Australia the state of the, of, of the national That's accounts. The and they've got a very good reason, you know, Paul, because you remember your One Nation I tax cuts, you, you right. know, the LAW law tax cuts. You know that they were based on estimates that were co cooked up in your own office. Oh. They were, well, I had have, I have the evidence of, I had the evidence of, of the then Put the Secretary, the the then the Secretary of the, the Treasury, Tony Cole, on a Four Corners program, and you know this, said that unlike normal custom, the estimates were in fact devised in your office, that was not, by, not by the Treasury. That was untrue. So the Australian that people are being told by you that they're not good enough to be told the true state of the national accounts. I mean, you've just spent two but minutes John, ignoring just, the most fundamental question John, how can you about costing How altogether? can you say that when you have today refused to reveal how you'll fund your election I'll commitments? I'll be revealing I mean, them in Thursday. I mean, look, you're, you're becoming, I'll be, I'll be putting you're my becoming I'll a be putting specialist in this saying... He won't tell us, but, but, but I'm the only one, uh, Ray, I'm the only one who stood on, there come. and put the numbers out. I mean, okay, you've we'll just spent two minutes avoiding the central issue of the campaign. Right. But it's not... You, it's, won't, you won't let the Treasury the tell the public all. the it's truth about, about the books. That's the central issue. I mean, you can go on about 83. You can go on about 83, you can go on about 83, you can go on about policy, but what are you hiding? Well, let, let, me ask no, you, let me ask you the question, John. I mean, if, if in fact the big businessmen and the economists and the Reserve Bank are right, if in fact there's a sizable deficit, whether Paul Keating knows about it or not, and he says he doesn't, if there's a sizable deficit, if you were to get into office, $3 billion or $9 billion or 15 if you listen to your mate Jeff Kennett, um, does that mean then that your policies are going to have to be savagely cut when you get there? Because well, I can, I can tell you this, the promises I'm making to people won't be. Irrespective of what uh, the deficit is. Well, they be. won't be. I mean, we have predicated our commitment but you've said uh, no, no tax no, increases. No, no, well, no well, can, I, can I just finish it? We have predicated our commitment uh, about having an underlying surplus on the basis that the May figure remains good. But so far as, I mean, that's the basis of that commitment. But if there are, if, if I make commitments to individuals, I'm not going to break those commitments. But if you're but, $9 billion in debt, I'm sorry. Well, 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 no, it's a fair if question. You're, if you're $9 billion in debt <coughs> and you, you find you're in government, aren't you going to have to sell Well, I, I, I don't believe it's that. Uh, I, I, I actually have quite a high regard for the forecasting capacities of the Treasury and the Department of Finance. Both of them are very professional outfits. That's why we ought, for the purposes of illumination in this whole campaign, we ought to have the benefit of their advice. I mean, it, it is... But if you trust them, why person, do you need the truth? Why are you making such an issue? there's only one person... Well, I mean, because there's only one person... He won't give us his funding commitments. Why, but why That's aren't why. you? I mean, my funding commitments will you all be explained... You won't own up, John. They will be explained next Thursday, right? But, well, well, if, if gonna, I, I explain my funding commitments take, next so, Thursday... You're going to take some of no, no, come on, don't interrupt. You're going to take no, some no, of come on, come, come, don't interrupt. You've had a good go. If I explain my funding commitments next Thursday, will you let the Secretary of the Treasury brief the Australian people next Thursday about the state of the books? Uh, Ray, let's get this clear. Will the you? budget is in surplus. Notwithstanding... But I want to hear that from the well, Treasury, not you, from you. Well, please don't you interrupt, John. The budget is in surplus. Next year, it would have been three point. Four billion in surplus, but Mr. Howard willfully knocked 2.5 billion out of the service, out of the surplus by refusing the sale of the airport. C can I ask the you, I mean, as an estimate, Audrey Aussie, I mean, well, why, okay, where Ray, are all the economists and bankers, yeah, but, and but Ray, why are they look, wrong? Look, John wants to get away from the central issue of the campaign, the really central issue, and that is why, after 20 years of believing in a whole range of policies, he now no longer believes them. Why he's trying to look like a Fabian socialist, a Labor leader, when he's always described himself as the most conservative leader the Liberal Party has ever had. And I could ask him perhaps this question, John. What if I were to say to you, look, I've believed in the Republic all my life. I've believed in a Republican model for Australia. But because now there's quite a few people still have these traditional attachments to the monarchy, I'm now a monarchist. I'm now a monarchist. Would I be entitled to be believed? Would I be entitled to be believed if after all those years of, of support, of belief in a republic, I say, at five minutes before an election, I now believe in the monarchy? And that's what I asked John. Why does he think he's entitled to be believed on Medicare, on industrial relations, on the environment, when at every stage of his political career, until just five, sort of five minutes ago, he was opposed to Medicare and wanted to destroy it. He was for basically moving to a radical change in industrial relations to push people on individual contracts, which will see their wages and the conditions cut. And why has he always attacked everything we've done in the environment to find five minutes before an election, he wants to get out there and say he's an environmentalist. I mean, I'm not entitled, Ray, to say I'm a monarchist. 
any more than John's entitled to say. He's <laughs> Look, seen I, the I, light I, five one, minutes before. There's a lot of things I know about you, Paul, and one thing I do know about you, that whenever you're in trouble on a mainstream political issue, you always crank up on the public. I mean, there we were, we were talking about, we were talking about the state of the books, we were uh, talking about whether you were willing to let the Australian people know. But I've done no, it today, just, John. Just I've done moment. it today. No, I've you accounted. Haven't. I've no, been you out haven't. there. No, I've you been haven't. out. It's on the news. The, the, you the might starting point it. of any truthful debate about costings in this campaign is to know whether or not the forward estimates released by the Treasury last May are still valid. And you have spent 10 minutes dodging and weaving and not avoiding that. And you can drag up the Republic and, you know, cheers no. me now in here. You're cranking John, up the good old Republic. Is, when you're why, in trouble, why did you change we'll, run your mind, the, run the Republic uh, over the trail in front of Howard. That'll get him going. John, uh, I, I just want to Boy, I can pick you a well, mile. Just a second. Why did you change your mind on Medicare after all these years? Why did you change your mind on industrial relations after all these years? Why did you change your mind? Isn't it you like to just tippy toe into office and then we all get the bad news later? Or at least tippy toe into office and get the bad that, news later. That reminds me of 1993 when you said you would put up No, 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 you've had enough. You've done very well, thanks. Let me go into Medicare then. Let's take up the topic that Paul's raised. I mean, what's the best thing about Medicare? I think the Medicare gives people a sense of security. Look, um, when Medicare was first introduced, I was critical of it. Critical? I don't, I, I, I don't deny that. Critical? I, I don't deny that, and so were a lot of other Australians. But over the years, uh, people have grown to support it. It gives them a sense of security, and it now has our total support. And there's no law of politics that says that you can't, over a period of time, change your view about an issue. I mean, Paul, you were once a passionate advocate of a goods and services tax. You went around the country and That's you right. said anybody who didn't support a goods and services tax was sort of a gutless wimp. And yet you changed your view over that. I mean, I accept that when, I, when Medicare was first introduced, I was critical of it. And I won't deny critical. that because it's on the... Years. But uh, um, over the years, I've seen the Australian mm. people grow to like it. They, it gives them security. What they are now worried about is the fact that they can't afford health, private health insurance. The biggest complaint I hear about the health system is the number of people going out of private insurance. And even Graham Richardson, a former health minister, said that once the number of people in private health insurance falls below 40%, you have a big problem. In 1983, when Mr Keating's party came to power, 61% of Australians had private health insurance. It's now down to 35%. And the more people drift out of private health insurance, the greater the strain you are putting on uh, the public uh, health system. So what we need to strengthen Medi Medicare, to buttress it, to protect it, is to give people taxation incentives, and we'll be announcing our policy on that tomorrow, to either remain in private health insurance... Like re rebates? Uh, well, tax rebates is a good way, like rebates, you know, rebates that were dreadful things until a week ago when the Prime Minister suddenly decided it's, to give them. It's not a tax rebate. Can I just make it very clear that uh, I don't deny the criticism I made of Medicare uh, ten or more years ago, or eight or nine years ago. I, I don't deny that. Uh, people change their views on issues, just as Paul Keating has changed his view on the GST, so I have on Medicare. It is now root and branch part of our policy. But do you understand, John, why people would say, cynics might well say, well, hang on, this is clearly sees that they lost votes last time, there are votes there, let's jump on board? Well, I don't believe they will, because I don't think anybody says... Do you believe you... in the principle or just the votes? I believe, I believe in principles and I have, I have put forward policies, even in this election campaign, which opinion polls say the majority of Australians don't agree with. I mean, my proposal to, f to sell one third of Telstra Opinion polls say that the majority of people don't agree with that. I mean, at least I'm being honest. All right, well, he come went to the that. last let's... election saying he wouldn't sell the Commonwealth right. Bank, and as soon as he got in, he got rid of it. I'll come to that. What about... let's, let's stay with Medicare then for, yeah. for a moment. I mean, you've come out the other day in Western Australia saying after you announced the $500 million program, and you said this is a good thing. If it's such a good thing, why didn't you do it 13 years ago? Well, let me just... Because we're building on the rock of Medicare. The principal, the principal characteristic of Medicare is universality of access for everyone in the country to a public hospital. That the Labor Party believes we are all members of the Australian family and that the health of any one of us is important, as, uh, is important to all of us, whether we're a billionaire or whether on, we're on low incomes, and that the principle of access to public hospitals and that 85% rebate is the rock upon which it's built. What we've done now, Ray, is extend it beyond medical services into orthodontics, 
into dentistry, into chiropractics, into physiotherapy, and it's not a tax rebate, as Mr Howard says, it's a cash rebate over the counter at a Medicare office. Mr Howard's tax rebate proposal would help 20% of families, our proposals help 80% of families, and it, a tax rebate goes only to a taxpayer. There are plenty of people looking after children who are not taxpayers, and you get it only at the end of the year. So there's a very great difference. But let me just make this point about, about Medicare. Mr Howard said, oh, he made some criticism 10 years ago. This is what he said. Medicare is a total disaster. It's a national disgrace. These are his quotes. I will rip it apart. Uh, I will effectively dismantle it. Uh, bulk billing is an absolute rort. You'd hardly call these mild criticisms. Three years ago, not ten years ago, at the last election, he put his hand up with John Hewson to take 13 million Australians out of bulk billing, to cut 1.3 billion out of public hospitals, and to reduce the Medicare rebate to 75 per cent. And when I told him that three years ago he wanted to kill Medicare off, he said, oh, I wasn't going to kill it, I was only going to change it. And that's why I've said he didn't want to kill it, he only wanted to make it dead. That is, one of the key things in Medicare is bulk billing, uh, one of the key things is that 85 per cent rebate, and access to a decent pr a public hospital system. Medicare also has a private hospital component. We give an 85 per cent rebate for all medical procedures in a private hospital, but we don't pay the accommodation. But in our policy rate, we're giving people a genuine choice. They can buy these services over the counter uh, at a, with a doctor or a physiotherapist and go back to Medicare, or they can spend some of the money on their private health if they wish. But we're not forcing them. What John's about is forcing people into a two-tier health system. A, right, a rich guy right. played the I system for the wealthy and a, a poorly resourced one for everyone well, 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 can, quick, can, can we just you know, quick work. end the discussion and say, make it very, very clear that uh, Medicare stays under the coalition, so does bulk billing, sure. so does community rating, but we sure. will build on that by giving all families, all people, uh, an opportunity to uh, take out private health and, insurance. And, you are and we, will give them, we will give them, through the tax system and also, Paul, You'll be sorry to hear through the Medicare office as well. Uh, a you're, rebate you're, to defray the cost of their health insurance. Our policies, I, will send you a signed our I will send you a signed well, copy of the policy flat. tomorrow with great pleasure. Right. What's, what's, what's the, the budget the, figure on that? What's, can you give us tonight the uh, figure of that? What's going to cost? Around five hundred million. So about the same as yes, except and, and and it will be worth about four hundred and fifty uh, dollars uh, for a family with children. That will be the value of the rebate, and uh, two hundred and fifty for a couple and one hundred and twenty five dollars for a single c c uh, uh, under the Keating policy couples without children and singles don't get any help c can you understand that someone watching tonight would say hang on this it sounds to be like uh, bib and bub in this one that uh, when it comes to oh, bib and bub. when it comes to money for uh, for roads in northern new south wales when it comes to ferries for tasmania when it comes to five hundred million dollars for health um, they're saying the same thing well there may be some areas where there are similarities Is he but, your policy? but, but uh, uh, well, in the end, the Australian people will make a decision on the totality of both our policy. I mean, there's one, there is one policy he won't pinch, and that is our policy to reduce youth unemployment by getting small business right. going again, well, because he won't get the government off the back of small well, business. Let's go to unemployment. This time last year, at the debate last year between John Hewson and Paul Keating, Mr Hewson ridiculed uh, Paul Keating's promise that uh, he, would, uh, he would add 500,000 extra jobs. On the latest figures, it's 650,000. Are you prepared to congratulate? 713,000. Mm. 700. Well, well uh, I acknowledge the figures. Seven, uh, yeah. Well, I, I acknowledge them. Well, will you also well, acknowledge, well, John, will you also you acknowledge you that we well, have... Can I just well, say... You know, I was asked a question. Do you, will you, would you mind not interrupting? Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, nice. um, that, um, that I acknowledge the figure. Of course I do. But also, uh, you have to acknowledge that we have an unemployment rate now of 8.6%. We have a youth unemployment rate of what between 27 and 30 percent. I mean, that is that is not a joke. You've been in power now for 13 years, bar six months. You have either been treasurer or prime minister of this country for the last 13 years, and you cannot, by you know, smug off the cuff remarks or anything else, avoid your personal responsibility for the fact that so many young Australians are out of work, and you do not have a plan a credible plan in this election campaign to do anything about youth unemployment. The only way you can seriously reduce youth unemployment in this country, the only way, is to get small business going again because only small business has the capacity to generate the job. There's no point in recycling people 
year after year through training programs unless at the end of the process there are jobs for those young people to take up and unless you can develop a plan Paul to get small business going again well, it includes well, sacrificing right. things like the stupid unfair dismissal laws you haven't got a snowflake in health oh, chance of reducing on, youth John. unemployment come on, John. and you know, come it's, on, John. Not a, it's not a joking matter it's the most come serious on, social issue yeah, in this election is. campaign Ray, and you've been there 13 years Ray, John said he acknowledged the 713,000 we had a target of 500,000 we were ridiculed for it we're now at 713,000 3.3% employment growth every year, ten times the pace of Western Europe, three times the pace every year on average under the coalition but government. But there are still 777,000 people but, out of work. But it's not thing. good enough simply for John to say he acknowledges it when he blackguards the government uphill and downdale every week on unemployment. Our record on employment growth has been as strong as it's ever been in Australia. And can I just say on youth unemployment, on youth unemployment, when I introduced Working Nation, when I said we wouldn't leave the unemployed behind, the long-term unemployed or young people behind, his predecessor in office said it was a waste of money. That is Mr Downer, when he was speaking for the opposition. Now, Ray, can I just say that? This. Do, did you apologise for those young people yeah. you were told to go get a job? No, I, I, that was a, that was, I didn't say go get a job. Oh, someone was... You someone, no, you just Somebody get the context right. Look, mouth, no, no, get, get the context right. There were 158,000... 15 to 19 year old out of work when you were last in office, John. This year there's 88,000, 40% less. And let me also tell you, when you were in office, three young people out of 10 completed secondary school. This year, just under eight out of 10 complete secondary school under a Labor government. In other words, we care about people 15 to 19. We regard this as a period of vocational preparation and we want them in school and structured training. But for those who are not in school, and structured training, and of course in your day, seven out of ten weren't, weren't in school, they left at 15 years of age, but those who are not in school and stuck structured training and are out there in the labour market, we're giving them case management and a job subsidy, and we try and get them back into school and back into structured training. And there's 88,000 of them, 88,000, which is 8% of the group of 15 to 19 year olds, not 30%, 8%. The people, young people looking for work in the group 15 to 19, that's 88,000, is 8% 8 of the total of the group of 15 to 19. Well, don't try, and, don't try and define the youth unemployment problem out of existence by statistical manipulation. No. Don't, don't take my there's, word there's for it. I mean, can, I just rely on, can I just rely on the words of Robert Fitzgerald, the former head of the St Vincent de Paul Society and now the head of ACOS. When you last ran that 8% number, he said that the cruelest thing that people can do with the youth unemployment problem is to manipulate the figures I'm not manipulating and pretend it doesn't look. The real Working figure nation. is 27 to 30 we've got percent, and you know it. Don't try John, and run this figure of 8%. We've got 1.6 billion out don't, there don't with Working Nation. Nation. We're, now, we're now taking young people in years 11 and 12 in school. We're starting the to give them... still 26 percent, give or take, of young people are out of work. Of the it? group actually looking for work. But the point is this, Ray. Eight in ten young people are now in school where they should be. But educating it, it, themselves. When John Howard was around, it was three in ten. They were quite, look, Ray, the Liberal Party was quite happy to let to let our youth, the bulk of our young people, seven out of ten of them, walk out of school at 15 years of age. This government has put a fortune into high completion rates in secondary schools, and one of the great beneficiaries, of course, young women who are now completing at but, such a rate. But, Paul, you can you can both talk about this, but Australians out there know that around their neighbourhoods they see the crime going Absolutely. up. They, yeah, see, sure. they see violence going sure. up amongst young people. Sure. Your own health department issued a report yesterday saying that, uh, that the incidence of heroin amongst young Australians, despite the 100 million drug campaign, has risen 75%. These are the things that don't make words, you can't make words about. These are the things that are actually breaking of our course. society apart. Of, of, of course it is, Ray. And, and when a government focuses a massive, closely uh, targeted package like Working Nation at the problem, and we now have 40% fewer young people looking for work than there was a decade ago, it ill behoves the Liberal Party to say it was a waste of money. All right, Paul, I, Paul, let's, I mean, you have been there 13 years and, and you still have this huge youth unemployment problem. You've talked for two or three minutes about programs. You haven't addressed any words at all to what you're going to do to help small business 
generate the jobs. Would you no have good an answer, having have an answer for these program. young people? Could you give them jobs? Uh, well, I tell you what, I can do a lot better than he's done. And That's the, easy and, to say when you're yeah, no, well, But I've got a plan. It, it I mean, I, no, it didn't I've, I've, got, I've got a plan to get small business going again. I mean, small business is the great hope of the side as far as job generation is concerned. I mean, we've got to get rid of the, the stupid unfair dismissal law we have at the moment. Every small businessman and woman I talk to around Australia, they all complain about that. They don't mind a fair law. How many jobs will that create, Jim? I think that would create a lot of jobs. But, but again, uh, we're, we're in words. Someone sitting at home watching this tonight and says, I haven't had a job for two years. Mm -hmm. All they're doing is giving me words. No, it, 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 no it is not giving people words to say that if, that if you have a law that actually intimidates small employers out of taking on more staff because they can't afford to pay the out-of-court settlements. If they have an argument with somebody who's not performing well, we are committed to reducing the red tape that small business has to uh, uh, grapple with by 50% in our first term. I've already committed a coalition government to reduce the provisional tax uplift factor to the tune of $180 million a year. Uh, we have policies of that kind and our industrial relations policy is tailor-made to uh, provide the right climate of flexibility within the workplace for small business. I mean, it is only by getting the government off the back of small business. Right. Uh, you'll never hear that from the present oh, government because me, they have me, no sensitivity John, let me say a word about it. No, don't interrupt. They don't have any understanding that the average small business operator in this country doesn't have the resources to handle much of the paperwork that is thrust down their throat by this well, government and they have added to it in the 13 years that they've been in office. Let's come to your industrial relations policy. I mean, quite clearly it's, it's one of the key issues for voters in Australia. Is there going to be a showdown with the unions on March the 3rd? That's the image. So. I don't believe so. Are you sure? Yeah, I am. I am. I am. Look, Ray, it's, 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 it's part of, in a sense, the game plan. I mean, the unions and the Labor Party, they're all part of the one big family. I mean, Gary Gray, your National Secretary, told us that a few weeks ago. Gary oh, said, William, what you've got to understand is this great historic link between the Labor Party and the trade union. Sorry, historian, and John, and you will that. go through, you will go through, uh, the unions will go through the business of saying, oh, you know, if Howard gets elected, you know, the world will come to an end. I can remember that <laughs> in New South Wales, the, the, the union movement well, said that if Greiner got elected, the world would come to an end. And the fact is that if we win the election, uh, they, the, the leaders of the union movement, they are Australians before anything else, and I respect that fact. They will respect the mandate of the Australian people. We won't agree on everything. They won't be but, part of our government, but I do not believe that there will be confrontation. But I you really don't, very, because at the heart, moment, most the, of them... The are Maritime Australians. Workers' Union are, are warning that, in fact, there will be strife on the waterfront. So there are hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent by some unions mm. to leaflet and campaign against you. But they're obviously worried about you. Well, well the Maritime Union pushed this bloke around. I mean, the Maritime well, Union. Hang on, some point, I'm right? answering the question. The Maritime Union told five him that he couldn't privatise A and L. I mean, it's not only us that the Maritime Unions have a row with. I mean, he just lost complete control of the industrial scene a few months ago uh, over the CRA dispute. I mean, you even had your erstwhile mate Bob Hawke take it out, take it out of your hands. Well, so, me right. I mean, let, let's not talk about Can, about difficulties. Can I get a five-minute reply? No, no, you've had a fair yeah, go. You've had a very right, fair yeah. go. The, the, the fact of the matter is, the union right. leaders in this right. country, by and large, are good Australians. You're going to talk. They are. They are good Australians, and they are not going to, in my view, defy the mandate, the democratic mandate given to a government by the right. Australian people. What John Howard has in mind is this: he won't. Now, having said that industrial relations is the last frontier of change, that of all the things in his political life that he has, has an absolute commitment to at radical labour market reform, he's now trying to pretend he's some sort of labour leader, he's a worker's friend. What he has in mind is this, no more collective bargaining. Every new entrance to the workforce, every person who changes a job within a three-year parliament, that's 40 per cent of the whole workforce, will have an individual contract they will not be able to negotiate collectively, there will be no union allowed to be involved and there will be no arbitration commission to make sure it's fair. He said he would stab the arbitration commission in the stomach, to use his own expression. The arbitration commission goes, as a consequence, the wages of working Australians will be cut, they'll have no recourse but to take the contract or not get the job. And he's been trying to pretend there's some sort of rights. He's been saying, we said, well listen, John, why don't you adopt the no disadvantage test and let the arbitration commission look at it. He, he says I'll have a no disadvantage test, not the no disadvantage test, one he's dreamed up and no arbitration commission. Now Ray, all, what all this means is within one parliament, 
40 per cent of people would be essentially on an individual contract under the master and servant provisions of the 19th century common law and they would have no one to support them but their local solicitor, no help from their unions and no help from their other employees. As a consequence, in a two, within six years, the life of two parliaments, basically you'd see massive cuts in real wages in Australia. See, John Howard talks about families. He says he's for families, but he's not for family support. The thing that matters most to Australian families is their wages, the income. He's opposed every wage increase bar two since 1978. Not a bad record. Every wage increase bar two since 1978. And now he wants to push people to the mercy of employers onto individual contracts. He wants to do exactly what Jeff Kennett said he wouldn't do and did, what Richard Court said he wouldn't do and did, and now what Mr Howard's saying he wouldn't do and will do. Obviously will do. So you're pulling no, 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 I really... You know, let's, be, let's just tick them off one by one. I am not going it's to. I, no, no. It's a terrible I, scheme. I am not. I am not going to get rid of the Industrial Relations Commission. Under my policy, no nobody. I repeat, nobody can be forced out of an award. Forced out of an award. Under my policy, there is an absolute guarantee that anybody who goes into a workplace contract has the benefit of the award conditions. That is an absolute guarantee. Uh, you talk about Richard Court. Do you know that uh, real wages in Western Australia over the last 12 months have risen faster than in any, than, than any of the Labor government states? What you have just said over the last couple of minutes is a complete distortion of it's our industrial relations truth. policy. What I stand for is an industrial relations system where people have a choice. If they want the help of a union, they can have it. Sure. If they want to negotiate on their own, they can. If they want the help of somebody other than a union official, they can. I am going to get rid of compulsory unionism because I don't believe Australians should be forced to join any organisation against their will. I have never stood for lower wages. I do not believe the path to higher productivity in this country is through cutting people's wages. You don't bring people on by threatening to cut their wages. You bring people on by offering them more. You, what I stand for is, is better pay for better work. Oh. I stand for an industrial relations system where people have a full range of choice. I do not stand for an industrial relations system that allows people to be exploited, but I certainly stand for an industrial relations system where people have a free choice. Do you want to stab in the, the Industrial like... Relations Commission in the stomach? Well, he stabbed it in the back. I made that comment, as he knows. I made that in the context of his rejection in April 1991 of a decision of the Industrial Relations Commission when you and Bill Kelvey pulled the carpet under the feet of the Industrial Relations Commission and you I said you would at least have the guts to stab it in the stomach rather than in the back. No, and you know that's, that's not what context. you said. That's, not, mean, what that's, you that's not what you said. That you will take a bloke's comment oh, right out of context. Well, go and read it. Your problem, Let anyone is, read your it. problem is that I remember okay, the context well, in which those remarks Ray, were made and you know it and your embarrassed response yeah. indicates it. John Howard said, you see, he has these tricky words, like no one will be forced off an award. And you say, well, that sounds all right. What happens to all the young people who, who take a job for the first time? <coughs> the, the, the hundreds of they thousands... Have to be offered at least the hundreds the of thousands who they leave school... Offered. Just hang on, dear, don't no, interrupt no, no, either, no. John, thanks. The ones who leave school, the most vulnerable, someone 18 years of age or 19 years of age, leaving school, taking work for the first time, women rejoining the workforce, migrants, they will have to take an individual contract or they don't get the job. And the other thing he glosses over is that 1.7 million Australians either take a job for the first time or change jobs. In fact, people within five years, 60% of people have changed jobs. The moment they do, the award is gone. In other words, so when he says he's not forcing them off the award, he just has to wait until the young people start looking for work or women rejoin the workforce or someone changes job and then snap-o, he's in there, and away goes the award, away goes the award protection. Then he said also he'll keep the arbitration commission, but he won't let it look at the contracts. Whether he keeps it is immaterial. He will not let it do as it does now, vet every individual contract. He's got a, a recipe the same as Richard Court, and the same as, uh, uh, that's why they say in Western Australia, don't be caught twice. Do you want to uh, well, yeah, well, I, I, I do. I, I just answer mm. that. Under our policy, anybody entering the workplace for the first time, if they go into a contract, they have got to be 
offered the value of the award under that contract. What you have just said, that's, you know, is a, com is a complete, is a complete distortion nonsense. of our policy. A complete nonsense. Uh, Ray, under our that's policy, anybody nonsense. changing jobs, if they go into a contract... Well, who enforces they, they, Now, let me finish. If they go into a contract, they have to be offered under that contract the value of the award. The award, the value of the award is the starting point. I mean, that is the explicit guarantee that we have given in our policy. Who, who is the police manager in that case? Who, is who, who polices it? Who arbitrates in, on this particular well, well, if a person stays under an award, the situation continues as it does now. If a person goes into a workplace agreement, they must uh, be paid at least the value of the award. And if they're now not... Now you're dodging no, 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 Who polices it? I, I just, this is a very important question, mm. and, and I'll, I'll answer it very carefully without interruption. If they feel they have... Uh, a grievance or a complaint, we have established a new body called the Employment Advocate and a person can go to that Employment Advocate without any expense if that person has a grievance. The Employment Advocate will get in touch with the employer and say, look, you have underpaid this person. If you don't pay it, uh, we'll chase you for it, we'll get it and we'll pay it to the person in question. And all of that can happen without any expense, no expense oh, at all, to the individual right. worker. Now, now, there is absolute protection. What Paul has There's said no about people being at There's risk no is protection. a complete right. dishonest we, distortion of our not, policy. I mean, people right, right, know, we must move on. One, 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 one word uh, on the advocate. On. The advocate has no statutory power. Could you imagine an 18-year-old person, an 18-year-old going to an employer and the employer says, here's an individual contract, and then the 18-year-old goes to some office called the advocate who has no statutory powers, no power the, to intervene. The advocate will no have all the statutory power what in the world. What chance would that young person <laughs> well, that, have that of getting the job? Paul, you, are, you are going from bad to worse. We must, we we must move on. We are completely, deliberately misrepresenting it in you. No, we're not going to leave young kids exposed to that kind of exploitation. And you want to let's, know. let's move on. Obviously, anyone watching here tonight uh, has had their, the two prospective uh, Prime Ministers uh, saying complete opposite and swearing that they both tell the truth. So let's leave it at that for the moment. Paul, can you the last election, you pulled off uh, what you called a masterstroke. You said the ALP would not oppose that GST if John Hewson was elected Prime Minister. You said basically you laid it in the line. Why don't you do the same thing with Telstra? Why don't you come here and say, if this government is elected, that you will support the Telstra sell-off and, and give the Australians a choice? John Hewson is now looking rather, rather wholesome and old-fashioned, I must say, compared to John Howard, because he took the view that if you want support, you go and get a mandate. And he laid out fight back uh, in 1991, and he took it to an election in 1993. He put his document out. He said, this is what I believe in. This is, this is the core of it, the goods and services tax. These are all the funding commitments. And he put it into the marketplace. Exactly the same thing as Mr Gingrich did with the contract with America. But with Telstra, John what Howard, John Howard said no, that he no. wants to sell off 30... No. You know the details of no. that. You don't need any more information. The thing, the thing, is, the thing is this. There, uh, there, is, there are many issues here. He has not laid out. He has not laid, it, laid out his proposal. He has not. Look, here we are, 20 days, 20 days before an election, and we don't have his funding. We don't have a lot of the major policies. He's now saying he's doing health tomorrow. The fact is this, right? No, but, there, but there, Telstra, you know, Telstra. There, let's stay on that subject. Not yeah, go back. Well, you know the yeah, details on that. On Telstra, when I say I know the details, what details? I mean, this is something 20 times the size of Qantas. Kim Beasley was flat out getting Qantas sold at a decent price for the Commonwealth. And who's going to be protecting the public purse with the sale of Twelstra 20 times its size? Bronwyn Bishop. Now, and where would the power go? Would it be a joint stock company? Are there articles of association? Does the Commonwealth have any role? Because if the Commonwealth does not have any role, there will be time local calls across the country. If it's a business, they will run it as a business. When farms get connected, it will cost four or five thousand sometimes to get a line out of them and not the subsidised prices now. These are all the issues why Labor senators will have a mandate to preserve Telstra in public ownership. At the very same point well, that well, been made if, by if the If it's Democrats. such a worry, why don't you say, which is what I asked you a moment ago, why don't you say, OK, if you vote for the Liberals, you're going to get Telstra. We're going to sell Telstra. Why don't you say that? No, because they are not entitled to just drop, just before an election, a half-baked proposal for the sale of <laughs> Telstra and then basically go and grab the money and use on election commitment. Well, can well, I, I just say something? Well, it's really a tactic, well, the tactic, the tactic, the tactic, well, the tactic for an environment well, policy. Can I, can I just say that we're not selling off all of Telstra, we're selling a third. Right. And there's a, there's a difference between... Why sell a third? This is very <coughs> well, well, you no, no, because, because we believe 
that the, the right policy mix is to sell a third and to retain as we have. Um, two it's thirds, not about just no, 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 two thirds hands, government. Though, it's no, it's we're retaining two thirds government ownership, and there can't be more than twelve percent foreign ownership under our policy. And there's one big difference between Paul and me on this: is that I'm telling the Australian public before the election what I'm going to do on Telstra. Everyone knows that before the last election, he put his hand on his heart and he said, "I won't sell the Commonwealth Bank." I said, I won't you you sell put your hand on your heart and you said you wouldn't sell no. Qantas. You put your hand on your heart and you no, said I you didn't. wouldn't sell Australian Airlines. No. And every last one of them you've sold. And I know you'll do. Telstra if you get back into sold. office, you'll do the same thing. I mean, Graham Richardson told us he wanted to sell the lot. Five years ago, well, remember? Untrue. Remember? Oh, untrue. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That was, that was absolutely, absolutely yeah, you absolutely. told Kerry O'Brien election. 12 months ago it didn't matter if uh, John, Telstra wasn't in government hands. John, at the last election I was asked, would we sell Telstra in that term? I said no, and it's not sold. It's not sold. Like you, the Commonwealth you, Bank. you had it as an environment policy. You said the environment's important, but it's only important to the extent that we can force senators to pass the sale of Telstra. In other words, the environment wasn't a policy, it was just a tactic to sell Telstra. And you know as I know, once you have private owners in there for a third of it, then the fiduciary responsibility of those directors are such that the Commonwealth role goes back simply to a private company, to a public company. You wanted to break and all it up, the protection, you? And all the protections for time calls, out the window, all the spaghetti bowl of subsidies, out the window. All right. That's the reality of Telstra. That's, that's well, not, that, been, it's not been the experience, Ray, on that point. Right, let's well, let's, let's move along. Okay, let's yeah, move been, on. The experience with telcos overseas is that even those that have been 100% privately owned, you can retain the price caps. Are you caps sure you've got the National Party behind you on this? You've got the National Party behind you on this? Do you have the National Party behind you on the Absolutely. Queensland National? Absolutely. And we, even, Bob we have the National Farmers Federation behind us, which is the peak farmer organisation. They think our policy on Telstra is terrific. You've and got till tomorrow, though, for the uh, Australian the Conservation Foundation. You've got to either get rid of that link or else lose them. Well, well, the link remains, so you, and, 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 and the link does remain, and can I make it clear that I think Australians who care about the environment will expect the new parliament, if we are the government, to give a greater priority to our environmental package, which is the most comprehensive environmental package any government but, has but John, you know in 50 that years. he's against it and his party's mm. against it. The Greens are against it. The Democrats are against it. Perhaps the Conservation Foundation tomorrow. If you don't get that through, if you become government, you don't have environmental policy, well, I, do you? I, I believe I'll get it through. But, but you don't have an environmental policy if you don't <laughs> get it through. Basis. Well, Ray, I, I have no doubt that if we win the election and if we don't get control of the Senate, I have no doubt at all that when it comes to a choice between the best environmental package in 50 years or an ideological commitment to a 100% government ownership of Telstra, most people who care about the environment will want our environmental policy. But, but, but I mean, obviously there's no point having a fantastic environmental policy if you can't pay for it. Uh, but Ray, I am sure in oh, the end, or, what, what, I'm what, sure can, we will get it through the Senate. We're down to the last Ray, couple of minutes and I'd like to, now let's if, move on. If what John Howard had been Prime Minister, there would have been no Daintree, there would have been no Gordon Below Franklin, there would have been no Shelburne Bay, there would have been no Shoalwater Bay, there would have been no Jarvis Bay, there would be no six million hectares of trees put away, there would be none of the great wilderness declarations because he's opposed right. the external affairs power. The we won't have, any, we'll have no time, Paul, if I don't stop you here. Well, don't stop. Let, me, let me stay in North Queensland for a moment. We just need a couple of topics I want to go on to. Uh, the National Party again. Bob Burgess, who's running for Leichhardt up there, a member of the National Party, called our naturalisation ceremony a de-wogging ceremony. Mm. He also said he thought ethnic groups have too much power in Australia. Mm. He called for uh, homosexuals to stop calling themselves gay. Mm -hmm. Will you kick him out the way he kicked well, he's out not in Graham my party. He's in the National Party. He's in the party. Coalition, though. He's in the National Party, but from time to time you have some candidates Why saying silly things. Out, John, like but, but anyway, there's a Liberal candidate in Leichhardt, and I reckon he'll win the seat. What I think it's a, an academic question. Why don't you kick him out like I did with Campbell? No, yeah, we won't yeah. cop racism. We will not cop it. But you're prepared to be soft about it because oh, this yes, fellow... I'm soft about no, racism. this fellow told Fisher, he said... I won't use it in public because the newspapers get on to me, but I'll continue to use it in private. You should have said to Tim Fisher, outski, mm. out he goes. Mm. But instead of that, he's still there. Mm. Can but I ask you on that point? Let's, let's move on. Women uh, at the Hobart Conference, the National Conference, the ABC, you, you pushed, you, you talked a lot about, the party talked about the uh, number of candidates increasing to 35%. Mm. Uh, the safe seats, if you look at your candidates this time, have all gone to men. So when you lose, when you fate and goes, it goes to a man. Ross Kelly goes, last time went to a man. Jeanette McHugh to me. Where are these women you're going well, to our promote? Well, our commitment is, uh, our commitment is uh, lay down there 
in our party decisions, Ray. And, but where are the women I, in the safe and, seats? Paul? And uh, well, it's a matter of whether they are in the parliament. I think that's the important thing. And and, and there are women in safe seats, but the fact is, it, it, that's, the fact is in the, in the parliament. But Gareth the, Evans shifts across. But, he but, gets a safe. He but, gets the, a seat. but the key thing is, where that, are the women? The key thing is is whether the government has responded to the needs of Australian women. That's the key thing. And whether it's the, the Sex Discrimination Act now, or a quarter of a million childcare places, or the Home Child Care Allowance, or the Generalised Child Care Rebate, uh, or the Parenting Allowance, three things that we've just... and the Maternity Allowance, four things we've just put in the last three years... But don't put them in Parliament. Absolutely. Right, don't put I, them in right let's make this clear. When more women are in the Australian Parliament, when half the population is better represented, we'll be all stronger. All right, quickly, stronger. Where is, is, have you got Bronwell Bishop in a cupboard somewhere? Where is she in the campaign? She's doing a good job. We haven't seen her. She hasn't... Well, there's a, there's a natural... You're not worried uh, about uh, Right, no. No, certainly not. I think she's doing a very good job. Okay, can I ask you, with those, the pork barrel spitty, every newspaper every day has a list of the latest uh, uh, promise that you make or the promise you make. Um, spending, I mean, how many Tassie ferries can we actually have? Uh, how many railways to Darwin can we actually have? How many movies... Uh, uh, houses can we have? We've now got a new one, uh, uh, production houses and so on. Can you understand why people are cynical about well, these promises? Right. If they were unfunded, yes. But as I said at the beginning of this program, I'm, of the two of us, I'm the only one standing here with funded commitments. As always, at each election, the Labor Party funds its commitments. In other words, we do the things we think, we think it's important for Tasmanians to be able to get to the mainland at a reasonable price and quickly. We think it's important that the Pacific Highway has, re has rebuilt and that the hundreds of deaths we see are diminished by a decent, a, a decent road. It's important, for instance, uh, Ray, that you mentioned films, that this country builds on its great strength uh, as an English language country. We need country. three studios. We've got one of the Gold Coast and Sydney and Melbourne. Well, I don't think the Americans are worrying about how many studios we've got. Can I just say, say on the question of funding, I mean, we will be providing the details of our costings next Thursday. Well, our, our funding, our promises to date are a lot less lavish than his. Oh, no. We have, after all, in relation to the environment, explained where our most expensive commitment is going to be funded. And the key issue about funding is whether we can rely on the forward estimates of next year's budget. And you have spent this whole debate avoiding that fundamental question, all written, why it's won't all you let the, the head of the Treasury tell there, us the John. state of the books? Well, you, they're all that, written you can't right, be taken can, can, can I ask you, is this... Would you agree, would you both agree, this is the last hurrah for one of you? Whoever loses this is out of politics. John, are you out of oh, politics? Well, look, I, I think it's uh, fair of me to say that I won't be leader of the opposition after the next well, election. And did I for that? And, and, and Paul, are I, you out of politics if you lose this one? Uh, well, let's say I, I, would, I wouldn't be leader of the Labor Party either. Yeah. All right, well, we've got, um, I think we're down to the last uh, four minutes or so, and we had promised to give each of you uh, a minute and a half to tell why, I guess in this one, why you shouldn't be kicked out, Paul? Well, Ray, Australia is now a modern industrial country. Uh, it's grown at twice the pace that it grew under the coalition. It's been growing. It's, we've got a strong economy growing at twice the Western world average. We've got low inflation. We've got huge employment growth. Uh, we've got a lot of innovation in our products. We've got a big, edu a very strong education and tertiary education system. We're exporting our heads off and we're making the leap into Asia. The risk in this election, I think for Australia, is that the fire will go out. The crucible that that cabinet has provided to generate this country, to take its place in the world as a modern industrial country, will go. If people believe they could go three years to the opposition, to a party trying to copycat the government to adopt the government's policies and think they can go back, I assure them that the fire will go out. What's kept Australia changing in this decade is a government prepared to do, take the hard decisions and to make a change. The other thing is You're almost out of time. A, a, a team to what? Who was the alternative team? John Howard, Tim Fisher, Mr Costello and Mr Downer. You compare that to Mr Beasley. Okay, Mr. we've got the point, John. Your last word. Well, Ray, um, I think um, uh, the Liberal Party should be elected because I think this present government has now been in power for 13 years and it's developed all the signs uh, of arrogance, of being out of touch, of taking people for granted and it can't boast of a great record. I mean, when you have almost 30% of young people out of work, when you in 1995 had the worst current account deficit in the Western world, including Mexico, when you owe the rest of the world $180,000 million, when you have widening gaps between rich and poor, uh, when you have growing evidence of social division, you can't really claim to have uh, set the place afire and really led it effectively. I mean, 
But my opponent has this idea that you can separate leadership from what the leader does with his or her responsibility. You judge a leader by what happens during his leadership. And this man's leadership has produced all of those things. By contrast, we do have a plan. We do have a plan to do something about uh, reducing youth unemployment by getting small business going again. But importantly, one big difference is that we will lead a government whose word can be trusted. I won't be making any LAW law tax commitments to be repudiated immediately I get into office and for good measure okay. to rub the nose we of people with additional taxes. We must finish there. In a word, you may not like this, Blake, but do you respect him in a word? Um, I, I don't, in, a I don't, in a word, I don't think he, he's been he really a good Prime Minister. Really I, don't have, any, really does I, I don't have anything against him as an individual, right. but um, I think he's been a very poor Prime Minister. All right, we'll leave it there. Uh, Paul Keating, we thank you for your time. John Howard, we thank you for your time. We might talk about foreign debt and things like that the next time round. Would you uh, be prepared to come next time? My friend, he'll be in it. If it's, if I'm, I'm always in it, mate. If it's, if it's this format, Ray? Yeah. I am always I'll in be it, there. mate. I'm right. always in it. So you're quite agreeable to this format? I opinion. am always in it, mate. All right. John, we thank you. Paul, we thank you. And we thank you. Thank Australia you. very much indeed. Uh, good night and good luck.